In January 1836, forces loyal to Santa Ana had been driven out of Texas. So this is going to leave those who had been fighting against Santa Ana for one reason or another set to make some decisions. Where do we proceed from here? Well, we'll talk about that more in a second, but just know that in January 1836, most people in Texas believed they had time to make these decisions. In general, um, you didn't see military leaders campaign during winter months. And this is going to be especially true in Mexico because these northern Mexico areas where you have a lot of elevation, it can snow, uh, you don't have food to sustain yourself when you're moving north. So people in Texas generally thought, all right, we've got to figure out what we're going to do, but at least we've got until April, May, something like that, because there's no way Santa Ana will travel during the winter. So what you're going to see in January 1836 is... a uh, a period that they think they have time to make decisions. Well, during this time, there's going to be a lot of disagreements and a lot of arguing amongst the people of Texas. So during this time, we have this newly formed state government for Texas. It's going to meet at this place, Washington on the Brazos, where uh, you're going to have these leaders of this poorly put together state government that they'd slapped together during the consultation of 1835 start to try to figure out what do we do now as we mentioned Henry Smith is the leader of this thing and they're gonna start squabbling uh, among themselves over one issue or another one of the major issues in contention between Henry Smith this general council this legislature of Texas is gonna be do we continue to fight for this Constitution of 1824 that was the decision made at the consultation of 1835 some people are gonna say well we've driven out Mexican forces why don't we push for independence and then annexation to the United States others are gonna say no we should continue on the path saying we're fighting for the return of the Federalist Constitution of 1824 but we're staying loyal to Mexico so you have these issues pop up within this newly formed state government there are other issues that are going to start tearing apart the uh, those fighting Santa Ana internally. One of these is going to come up among Tejanos and uh, American Texans. Again, a number of Tejanos, including Erasmus Seguin, Juan Seguin, had readily support the, supported the fight against Santa Ana. Well, some of these Tejanos are okay with the push for independence, but that's very, very few. The vast majority of Tejanos who are interested in one way or another say, yes, we we're fighting with you Americans, but we're only fighting against Santa Ana. This talk of independence needs to stop. We're Mexican. We want to stay loyal to Mexico. So there's going to be a sort of a minor di disruption between Tejanos and Americans. So this is going to be sort of... Uh, Hearing this new uh, Texas uh, state government apart is a dispute between Tejanos and Americans. Another uh, issue is going to arise with the army. So while the forces of, of Mexico had been driven out of Texas, Sam Houston is still going to be scraping together a professional army. The consultation of 1835 had given a little bit of money. You saw the state government give them a little bit of money and said, we need professional soldiers, militiamen, guys that are just off the couch. They're not going to do anything against uh, Santa Ana's uh, professional army if he comes up here. So Sam Houston, you need to get men, sign contracts, long-term contracts. You need to train them, and you need to get them uh, prepared for fighting Santa Ana by the time he comes back, which, again, everybody's assuming is going to be in April. So Sam Houston's got to put together this professional army. Well, he has a lot of problems because, one, some of the professional army he had put together, uh, some of the people he had brought under his new army, some of them, after the Mexican soldiers leave Texas, they're just going to pick up and leave. Oh, the fighting's done. We're taking off, okay? Uh, others of his that are joined the professional army and are going to be questioning his leadership. Well, who put you in charge of the army? Okay, this consultation of 1835. Okay, well, who put them in charge? People are going to be questioning Sam Houston internally. Uh, some of his own troops, some people that accept that Sam, Sam Houston are in charge, are not going to accept his decisions. Basically, he wants uh, his professional soldiers to start mustering around him, uh, create this big army that when Santa Ana comes in, uh, to retake Texas can fight them uh, face to face. Well, some of his soldiers are going to say, no, we don't want to uh, put our army under you. What we're going to do is invade Mexico. We're going to press the advantage. When the soldiers ran out, we want to go and 
take Matamoros, which is a city right across uh, the Rio Grande in um, what's today Tamaulipas, Mexico. We want to go and press our advantage. A lot of these guys are doing this. Some are doing it because they think it makes logistical sense, but most are doing it because they want to raid. We want to take stuff while we can. So Sam Houston is going to have to say, no, this is ridiculous. Um, uh, you need to. We need to start prepping in case Santa Ana returns. So he's in charge of an army, kind of. They're, he's in charge of a lot of men that won't listen to him. Technically, he's supposed to be in charge of the militia, but the militia haven't signed a contract with him. They're doing their own thing. This is going to be uh, ripping Sam Houston up. And again, he's he's still trying to recruit soldiers from um, eastern part of Texas. He's trying to get people from the United States to possibly come in, join his army with favors of or with promises of land. So Sam Houston's facing these issues. Another issue he's facing is, well, what do we do about San Antonio? Again, San Antonio, biggest city in Texas still at this time. Uh, and again, this had been the capital of Texas, uh, you know, under Spain, or for at least the last part of Spanish rule. Very big city. A lot of people in San Antonio are Tejanos, you know, a lot of Tejanos, again, on on the fence about uh, fighting at Santa Ana. Some, again, uh, are most against the idea of independence. So you got this big city here, and it's actually really close to Mexico. Well, Sam Houston... You know, we had that militia that had taken San Antonio just uh, a little bit before December 1835. Well, Sam Houston, he's having trouble trying to figure out if the militia should stay in San Antonio or if they should fall back, meet him. His army is uh, currently gathering in Gonzales and maybe even abandon Gonzales, push back, and then wait over here because this is where uh, most of the American Texans are. You know, gather our forces over here, wait for volunteers to come in from the United States. So he's sort of on the fence about what to do about San Antonio. Well, in the midst of all this disruption, all this chaos between the government, you know, fighting between Tejanos and Americans, uh, Sam Houston not doing, knowing what to do with his army, again, they're all thinking, well, we've got time to figure this stuff out. Well, come uh, February, they're going to learn they, in fact, do not have time to uh, figure this out because Santa Ana in a bold move it's going to determine that I'm going to put down this rebellion immediately. Basically his uh, brother-in-law, uh, Perfecto de Cas, had retreated across the Rio Grande, basically informed his brother-in-law, hey Santa Ana, these guys are in rebellion. Santa Ana had thought that, uh, uh, Santa Ana had thought this is a personal insult to attack his brother-in-law and he determined I'm going to put down this revolution quickly. Part of this is a smart, you know, he wants to do it before the Texan army can get further volunteers from the United States, organize themselves. Uh, part of it, he thought, is going to be surprise. I can take them by surprise. But a little of it's emotion. He wants revenge for what's happened to his brother-in-law, him being defeated at San Antonio. So Santa Ana begins gathering an army. Now, a lot of this army is going to be professional soldiers with experience. Again, in very few armies in the world have more experience in Mexico uh, in 1836 because for the past you know, uh, 15 years and then even going to the Spanish period, you had a lot of people fighting. You know, had people fighting against Spain. Then you had Centralists fighting Federalists. So a lot of his men have been in battles before. A lot of his men, however, uh, he sort of gathered on the way. So he's going to march out of Mexico City, start marching through these mountains of northern Mexico. It's a particularly rough winter. There's going to be a lot of snow. A lot of his soldiers are going to die on the way, by the way. Uh, and a lot of the soldiers that die are going to be not the professionals, not the officers. But as St. Anna goes along, he's going to stop at these smaller cities and forcefully recruit a lot of peasants, a lot of Indian peasants into his, his army. And a lot of these guys don't have proper uniforms, equipment. So as they're marching along in the snow and the cold weather, uh, a number of them are going to die. So at one point, the army gets above 6,000. Uh, but about 400 of those uh, will die en route. Um, Santa Ana is later going to split his forces when he gets close to Texas. We'll talk about that more in a second. But in February uh, 1836, Santa Ana's army will reach the Re uh, Rio Grande River, and they're going to cross into Texas. And shortly thereafter, they're crossing the Oasis, which is the generally considered the historical boundary of Texas. And Santa Ana is going to have a decision to make. Some people argue he should have headed right towards where Sam Houston was, gathering his forces in Gonzales, 
or maybe headed right towards the forces over here in um, East Texas, cut off uh, the United States. Some people are going to even argue, you know, maybe he should have taken uh, what, what little Navy the Mexico had and maybe sail up here, take Washington on the Brazos or um, go over here to Far East Texas uh, and then blockade the United States, uh, prevent further volunteers from going in. But Santa Ana is going to determine to take San Antonio. He thinks this uh, for a number of different reasons. Some is symbolic, again, San Antonio, the capital of Texas. Some think it's just revenge because his brother-in-law had lost San Antonio. Uh, it just could be logistically. You don't want to leave uh, any enemy behind you as you go forward. In San Antonio, there's uh, militiamen uh, there in San Antonio. Uh, so he is going to take... A good chunk of his forces, most of them, send him to San Antonio. He's going to send another group uh, with his brother-in-law up the coast, but he personally will march on San Antonio uh, and uh, decide to attack it. Okay, so um, uh, he wants to again retake the capital, get revenge for what happened to his brother-in-law. Well, Sam Houston learns in the middle of February that. Um, uh, uh, that basically, or I'm sorry, uh, the very beginning of February, that uh, Santa Ana is entered Texas and is marching on San Antonio. Well, what do we do about this? Well, Sam Houston doesn't know exactly how many soldiers San Santa Ana has, so he's going to send word to the militia captain out there, a guy named James Neal, to, uh, to basically make the decision. You decide if you can defend San Antonio, you go ahead and defend it. But if not, I want you to retreat here. I want you to join your men to the army I'm gathering here at Gonzales, and um, and and you know uh, we can sort of stand together. We, as we're going to see, retreat east, uh, gather volunteers here in the east. So you, James Neal, you make the decision. Well, um, uh, as we're going to see, it's not really going to be James Neal making the decision because soon after Sam Houston sends this order, uh, we're going to have. Um, the governor Henry Smith he actually dispatches this guy William Barrett Travis uh, we've talked about him briefly before this attorney who had come into Texas to deal with the slaves uh, we talked about the Anahuac and Velasco incident Travis had been there before he'd recently moved to Texas joined the professional army uh, Henry Smith had made him a part of the professional army he heard about what's happening in uh, San Antonio he's gonna dispatch William Travis uh, to San Antonio uh, and it's, he's going to leave it up to Travis to decide what to do about the city, you know, whether to abandon there, whether to retreat. Well, Travis will arrive very beginning of February 1836, and he's going to decide, all right, I think we can hold this place. Again, he doesn't know exactly how many numbers uh, that, uh, uh, how, much me how many men Santa Ana has, but he thinks with his 29 men, the, the militia that are already there in Texas, he thinks he can defend the Alamo, uh, or this area we're going to call the Alamo, uh, and he thinks he can do this because he thinks that additional reinforcements are going to be on their way. Um, as we'll talk about in a second, he thinks Sam, Sam Houston might send reinforcements. This guy named James Fannin, who had taken over forces in Goliad, possibly could send men to reinforce Travis. Part of the other reason he thinks he can defend is because at the heart of San Antonio is what remains of this Alamo mission okay this had actually been one of the missions that we've talked about a while back that was founded in the early 1700s to cater to the Coal Tech and Indians so for a long time missions haven't been in use basically uh, all Coal Tech and Indians uh, were pretty much Hispanicized by this point generations of uh, Coal Tech and Indians had spoken Spanish uh, become Catholic things like that we talked about at the very end of the 1700s, early 1800s, missions have become secularized. Uh, and so for a very long time, essentially the Alamo had been used for, uh, as a barracks for a cavalry unit for Mexican soldiers. So it used to be a mission, but in previous years, because missions were no longer needed, uh, it had been served as a housing and quarters for soldiers. Well, this is in the center of uh, San Antonio. Again, the way missions were built was from defense uh, against Plains Indians. So Travis is going to look at this. It's a very big area, but he thinks if he gets more reinforcements, he's going to be able to defend this huge mission complex. Part of the reason he thinks is, is 
I've got 19 cannons. So uh, some of the uh, Travis's forces had arrived with cannons. Some of the people that had taken uh, uh, in this area December had captured cannon from the Mexican forces, Costas forces. And so they have 19 cannons to defend it. Again, Travis, he doesn't have enough men initially, the beginning of February, to defend this long area, this, this large area. It's, um, I believe it's like an acre and a half, uh, something like that. Perimeter is almost a quarter of a mile long. So at this point, he, he doesn't have enough men to defend it. But he didn't think, uh, think that's going to be an issue because he thinks reinforcements are going to arrive. So Travis will make the decision, I'm going to defend this. So this is going to be uh, what, what uh, uh, he will decide at the beginning of February 1836. So he actually sends out couriers, uh, hey guys, Goliad, we need reinforcements here. I've heard Santa Ana's on his way, send some reinforcements. Well, um, Sam Houston will, will sort of be on the fence about whether or not to send reinforcements. The guy that's in charge of Goliad with the forces down there, a guy named James Fannin. He's going to determine, I, I need these forces here in Goliad, and we'll talk about there's some reason for that. You have some Mexican forces more moving towards Goliad, so he's not going to send these reinforcements. So Travis is not going to get the reinforcements he's thinking, but he is going to get some reinforcements. So um, shortly after arriving, Travis will um, uh, receive reinforcements in the name of uh, uh, some Tejanos will join him, Juan Seguin. Um, again, he and his father had been uh, joined the Americans and calling for fighting against Mexico. As we'll see, they will support the Texas being independent, that idea, although that's not, that idea hasn't won out yet by February 1836. Uh, and so some Tejanos will join the Americans in the Alamo. And this is one of those things that's very confusing about the Texas Revolution. People think this is Mexicans versus uh, um, Anglo-Texans or American Texans. I mean, that is true to an extent, but a lot of Tejanos or people of Mexican ancestry will be supporting the Americans. So a number of Tejanos will be uh, fighting alongside the Americans there. Uh, so he's going to have some Tejanos in the Alamo with him. And also he's going to get uh, some reinforcements under a guy named Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett, uh, a lot of people have heard stories about him. He was a politician in Tennessee. He has a famous background of being a frontiersman. You'll hear the story about how he's three years old, fought a bear. Um, he had so many famous stories about him. He became famous, uh, had plays written about him. Uh, and, uh, you know, he sort of leveraged his fame into becoming a politician, served as a, uh, uh, a House of Representative members for Tennessee, uh, served in, in various other political positions. Uh, but just like Sam Houston, he fell out of favor in politics. He was, he was uh, uh, lost in an election towards office. And like Sam Houston, he decided to come to Texas and... Um, and remake his political career. Well, he arrives right as this revolution is breaking out. He's going to join with some uh, volunteers from Tennessee, uh, and these volunteers are going to arrive in San Antonio, and William Barrett Travis, needing men to defend this Alamo, will welcome them in. So Crockett will join, uh, Crockett and his forces are going to join Travis. Well, this is going to be an issue because Crockett and some of the militia that have first arrived, a lot of these guys they hadn't signed these long-term contracts. They don't believe they're part of the professional army like Travis. Uh, a guy named uh, James Bowie will, uh, or Jim Bowie, you'll, you'll most often hear, will uh, be arguing with Travis over who's in charge of who. So you basically have all these different groups thrown together in this Alamo. By the end of February, numbering something like 180 is the low end. I've heard as high as 220. I believe the generally accepted number somewhere around 189 men of all these disparate backgrounds sitting here in the Alamo. And it's about the time, uh, the end of February, that you're going to see that uh, February 28th, as a matter of fact, this is going to be when Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana finally reaches San Antonio. So what we have is now Travis and, again, the 189 or so men in the Alamo are going to now be surrounded by uh, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Santa Ana different numbers for how many forces he has. Again, he sent some of his soldiers off towards the Texas coast. By this point, some men had died of exposure. Some men had deserted. 
Um, I've heard of different numbers, something like 3,200, I believe, is the, the number I, I uh, most recently heard. Um, um, but then uh, some of those will actually be redeployed a little bit later. But Santa Ana will arrive around the Alamo on February 28th, and it's at this point that Travis and his men will be prepared to fight. Now, Santa Ana initially is going to surround the Alamo, and what he's thinking is, I'm going to take these guys out by uh, uh, a siege. This is his initial plan is I'm going to consider a siege. So I don't need to go in and fight these guys. I can basically just starve them out. So initially he considers just surrounding them. Eventually they're going to run out of food. And then once they start running out of food, they're either going to surrender or I can send my men in. So basically he stations out these cannons around the Alamo. And for the next couple of days, the cannons will be firing on the Alamo, trying to break down the walls. Well, during this time, uh, William Barrett Travis, he's not, he doesn't have the men he needs to defend the Alamo, but he's not too worried at this point. He's not thinking he's going to be dying defending the Alamo, because what again he thinks is, we're going to be a lot here a long time. We've got some food in here, so we're going to be here for a while. I don't think Santa Ana is foolish enough to rush the Alamo, lose a lot more men because we're in defensive positions than, than uh, we'll lose. And he thinks that eventually I'm going to be getting reinforcements uh, from somebody, either from Goliad, which Fannin is going to say no, or maybe Sam Houston. Sam Houston, as we're going to see, is going to determine there's nothing I could do to say the Alamo is not going to be sending reinforcements. But Travis is not going to be aware of this because he's essentially not receiving word. So he thinks he's not going to die. He thinks he and his men will uh, successfully defend the Alamo. And uh, eventually Sam Houston or Fannin or whoever is going to come up here from behind Santa Ana. They'll start fighting and eventually they'll relieve them. Well, uh, February 28th, going into March, Santa Ana maintains this constant barrage of cannons, uh, keeping the Alamo defenders awake all night. And Santa Ana is going to receive word that very soon these new cannons are going to arrive that will be able to essentially fire on the fort, break down its wall. So there's a big debate. Some people, uh, again, think that they should maintain this siege. Um, uh, they they basically can't fire on the walls because the cannons in the Alamo, partly because they're in an elevated position and partly because they're better technology than ones Santa Ana has, Santa Ana can't hit the walls of the Alamo um, effectively. Um, uh, and so, but these new cannons up will be able to destroy the Alamo walls. So Santa Ana is going to be sitting there uh, end of February, beginning of March, and he's going to determine... I don't want to wait for those cannons. Now, why he makes this decision, you'll often see him get criticized for this. He probably should be criticized a little bit. He's basically going to determine, instead of waiting for the cannons to make an easy, clear path, uh, uh, you know, destroy one wall to where the men can rush in and take the Alamo much easier, he's going to determine, or instead of waiting until the men starve out, he's going to determine that he cannot wait, wait any longer. Part of this is smart in that he realizes that Sam Houston and the people in East Texas are getting volunteers every day, and the longer that he waits here by San Antonio means that the longer his enemy or the, the longer the Texans in East Texas have to build up their forces. But again, in taking this, not waiting for those additional cannons, he's going to be throwing away a lot of men's lives. So whether to criticize Santa Ana or not, you know, I, he is going to lose a lot of men in the process, and he and he could have waited just a couple of days for the cannons. But again, that would be a couple more days the American Texans can uh, have to gather their forces. Well, on March fifth, um, uh, March fifth, eighteen thirty-six, Santa Ana will basically surround the Alamo with uh, a number of Mexican lancers, so cavalry with lances, and he's going to do this to make sure that when he attacks, nobody can escape. So if he attacks from one direction, everybody starts uh, going this direction, the cavalry will be able to chase after him and, and kill him before they escape. And then he's going to determine, okay, well, the very at the uh, morning of March 6th, my forces will attack. I'm not waiting for the cannon. I'm not giving the forces in East Texas uh, time to gather their stuff together. 
And so what we're going to see on March 6th, beginning the very morning, and it's kind of interesting, the night of March 5th, you know, the morning of March 6th, the cannons of the Mexican army had been firing pretty much nonstop since, uh, since Santa Ana arrived. They're going to cease uh, the morning of March 6th because they want these guys to fall asleep. So when the attack commences, they'll be all groggy, and, and this will allow the Mexican army to take the Alamo much easier. Um, well, uh, morning of March 6th, the Mexican army will attack. They're going to lead this uh, force. They're actually going to attack. And the initial wave will be repelled. So the Texans, again, undermanned. Uh, they're going to start uh, trying to fire the cannons back. And these cannons are load with, loaded with, like, chopped up chains, horseshoes, things like that. And they're going to start plowing through the Mexican army uh, like shotguns almost. Um, William Barrett Travis, by the way, in uh, this initial barrage, you know, you'll sometimes see this thing. I believe that's supposed to represent William Barrett Travis. Uh, he shot and killed almost immediately. But the rest of the Texan forces will defend the initial, uh, the initial uh, uh, charge of the Mexican soldiers. Mexican soldiers will try to go up the wall. Texans will fight them back. A number of Mexican soldiers will die. There's actually going to be a second charge and then eventually a third charge. It's during this third charge the Mexican forces will manage to get up on the wall uh, uh, the surrounding the Alamo and it's at this point the defenders of the Alamo uh, will start falling back. Well unfortunately for them they didn't spike their cannons meaning you're supposed to drive a metal spike into the cannons to prevent the enemy from using them. So what the Mexican forces will do is they'll turn the cannons around fire on those uh, retreating and they're going to kill a number of these defenders in that manner. So uh, once they get over the forces there'll be uh, some more close quarters fighting. Some of the people will fall back to this chapel area here. Um, there actually were a couple of um, slaves of the Def Alamo defenders that had come along. Some had left uh, previously before this. Santa Anna had offered quarter to women and slaves. Uh, a couple women had and slaves had remained behind and taken refuge in this chapel where, again, uh, there used to be church services when this was a mission. Still church services, but... Um, built built during the mission period, but some fell back, uh, the defenders fell back into this chapel. Eventually, uh, Mexican forces will proceed into the chapel as well, uh, and they're going to kill the defenders in, in uh, that area. Um, now, and the Alamo will fall to Mexican forces. Now, we've all heard the story about the Alamo. Again, you know, uh, all the defenders uh, here, we've heard they all die. We've heard they took out a large number of Mexican forces. That's true. Um, again, something 189, 200 uh, defenders, uh, something like that. All of them will die. They do take out, again, they're in a defensive position. They're going to take out, you, you see different numbers on this. I've heard around 600 soldiers uh, that uh, as they try to take the Alamo. So it is a 3 to 1 casualties um, is what I've heard. Uh, so that is going to be a uh, you know a significant loss of life for the Mexican army, and so there are a lot of things that this Alamo is is going to be important for. However, some of the things you've heard about the Alamo, not factual or sort of uh, myths have arisen around it. One of the myths you often see is sort of the depiction of the Alamo, and this is a, a common picture. So you'll see pictures like this of the Alamo uh, as the Mexican army is taking it. Uh, one of the things you'll see is they'll have this flag or they'll have a, a traditional Texas flag fi flying above the Alamo. That wasn't the case. Uh, the Alamo defenders are fighting for the return of the Constitution of 1824. As we'll see... In another area of Texas, they're starting to change their mind about you know fighting for separate statehood and instead fighting for independence. But at this point, they're still fighting for separate statehood, or at least the people in the Alamo think they're still fighting for separate statehood. So the flag that actually flew above the Alamo was not anything like this, or wasn't a traditional Texas flag. It was actually the Mexican flag with 1824 on it. We want to return to the Constitution of 1824. So that's one of the myths that's uh, usually incorrect about the Alamo. Another myth about the Alamo is that it looks like it looks today. And you'll see the Alamo uh, in movies, things like that, have this little roof on it. Well, if you go to the Alamo today, it, it does have this roof. So it looks something like this if you, you go there today. It did not look like that when the Battle of the Alamo took place. As a matter of fact, it looked something like this. This roof is later going to be added after Texas joins the United States. The U.S. Army will take over the Alamo, use it as a supply depot. 
uh, and what they do is build this roof on top of it and uh, and they build this later on this was not there when this battle took place another uh, a myth you'll sometimes hear about the Alamo is it shortly before the fighting began William Barrett Travis drew a line in the sand saying anybody that wants to stay here and defend this thing um, across the line anybody else who doesn't want to stay here can leave well there's a lot of things that are incorrect about this basically right before the battle started William Barrett Travis is gonna send out a letter saying yeah we're gonna fight to the end but even at that point he's thinking that's not gonna be necessary because eventually we're gonna have reinforcements come here and relieve us you know they're gonna come up behind Santa Ana and take them out we're not gonna be dying to, to uh, uh, defend this thing. So basically, we don't think that uh, he thinks he's going to die. Until the end, he thought, you know, we're eventually the reinforcers are going to help us out. In the myth where you see everybody, um, you know, uh, step across this line, that doesn't come along until um, uh, until something like 1870. And the source for that is somebody said that one night somebody came to visit their house and the story doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense but they say somebody showed up their house had dinner at their house didn't give them their name told them that they were one of these people who had basically said uh, I'm not staying to defend the Alamo had left and um, uh, you know was one of the people that basically uh, didn't stay to defend the Alamo he had survived and then somehow showed up at this person's house told them this story so the first recording we have of the of the line in the sand myth is uh, is probably inaccurate. So that probably didn't happen. Um, you also uh, um, uh, another myth that you'll often see about the Alamo is that uh, everybody stayed to defend the Alamo. This is is also probably a myth. So we have evidence that one Mex once Mexican forces had breached the outer defenses. Some of the men, as most people would do in, in that instance, realizing that if this thing's lost, you're not going to do any more good sitting here defending it, tried to escape and basically crossed and, and escaped out of the Alamo and uh, started running for their lives. And it was at this point that the cavalry that Santa Ana had stationed around the Alamo uh, started cutting them down. Now, we think this is the case because... Um, there's going to be a pile of bodies that are going to be burned here. So basically, Santa Ana uh, is going to order all the bodies not buried, but but burned. And uh, one of the, the gathering of bodies is far outside the Alamo. And we think this is a group that tried to escape and were cut down by Mexican cavalry. So that idea probably not true. That everybody stayed and was defending this sort of uh, uh, you know nobody ran away. That you know that doesn't make sense from a human perspective. We uh, uh, you know, we have some s sort of self-preservation, and that was probably the case here at the Alamo. Another uh, a myth you'll you'll generally hear is that Davy Crockett went down s swinging. So Davy Crockett, if you ever read about him, see anything about him, amazing figure, heroic, did a lot of interesting things during his life. But by the time the Battle of the Alamo, he was again a prominent figure. He came to remake his political career when the Mexican army starts attacking. He's going to uh, retreat to the barracks, and we think you, there is some debate about this, but we're pretty sure that what happens is, he, as it's clear that the battle's lost, he's going to try to use leverage his fame or basically surrender, hoping to be spared by Mexican forces. They're not going to kill Davy Crockett. He's famous even in Mexico, and he'll probably surrender to Mexican forces. So we think that happens and what we think happens after he surrenders is that initially he's taken prisoner maybe meets with Santa Ana and then Santa Ana is going to determine I don't want to leave any uh, anyone left alive shortly before the siege or before the attack he raised no quarter flag saying uh, I'm not gonna let anybody survive and he's gonna um, he's gonna uh, adhere to that by executing Davy Crockett so Davy Crockett probably actually surrender. Now this is, a lot of people argue against this. There's a Disney series, a mini, uh, mini series of Disney shows. It shows Davy Crockett, played by Fez Parker, uh, swinging till the end, you know, wouldn't go down, wouldn't surrender. There was a John Wayne movie that's going to come out in the 1960s. Same thing, Davy Crockett doesn't surrender, he goes down. There is some evidence for that, but more evidence points to 
again, like like uh, most people would in a situation where there's no winning, um, he probably did surrender, but then was later executed. So that's probably an Alamo myth. So while these things are untrue, the Alamo is going to have uh, this would be a, sort of a depiction of Davy Crockett. Uh, towards the very end, um, uh, you know, with the soldiers around him that he just killed. Um, so while those things are probably untrue, there is some things that are true about the Alamo, and there are some reasons it's going to be important. Well, in a sense, it's some people view the Alamo as m maybe your forces could have been better used elsewhere. You know, maybe if you'd have taken these 200 men or so and you know, Sam Houston was recommending shortly before Santa Ana showed up, maybe you should you should come back, retreat Travis. Maybe if he'd have taken that advice instead of des deciding to defend the Alamo, maybe that you know 200 or so men could have better um, uh, be used elsewhere. Oh, one one other thing before the last man, some people did get out of the Alamo, like Juan Seguin. He was in the Alamo. He's going to escape shortly before the attack on the Alamo simply because uh, Travis sent him out with his uh, a message to uh, get reinforcements. So some people that were in the Alamo survived, but they left before the, the final assault. I should point that out. But some people are going to say that Travis could have taken the men and uh, uh, you know maybe been better used by, by Sam Houston. Maybe that, that was the case, but these men, being in this defensive position, probably did take out a lot of Mexican soldiers uh, uh, that could have later been used to, to fight Sam Houston. Uh, some people say the Alamo is important because, you know, the execution of the men, the fact that none of the people that were in the Alamo at the final charge are going to survive. As we'll see, Texans will later use this as sort of a rallying call to um, defeat the Mexican forces. Remember the Alamo, you know, they killed everybody there. And I probably think one of the biggest importance for the Alamo is that it's going to convince a lot of Texans there's no recourse to the Mexican government. Even if Santa Ana is overthrown, even if the Federalists get back in charge, there's been a lot of bloodshed between Americans and Mexicans at this point. And some of the people that have been pushing for independence, they're going to use this as you know, and actually, this this call began right when the Alamo was laid siege to before the final assault. Some people will say there's no reconciliation, and as a matter of fact, right before the the attack on the Alamo on March 2nd, 1836, at a meeting at the Washington the Brazos, we're going to have all these delegates, the the uh, uh, slap together state government, determine. All right, you know what we need to do is we need to declare independence. So. While the people at the Alamo were fighting for separate statehood, right before the final assault, they actually had finally declared for independence uh, on March 2nd, 1836. So, um, uh, interestingly, this is, uh, um, uh, even though they had the 1824 flag over here, over here at Washington, the Brazos, they're going to be saying, we're fighting to become our own uh, independent republic. And as we're going to talk about, um, you know, they're not fighting for, to thinking they're going to be an independent republic for very long. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe that importance is there. Some people also maybe think that it's important because while Santa Ana was fighting here, this is going to give Sam Houston time to pick up and leave uh, to start running away towards the east. So Sam Houston, after he learns about the fall of the Alamo, basically is going to burn down Gonzales, and he's going to start heading east to over here to East Texas where he can get more volunteers and hopefully get volunteers from the United States coming in. So... You know, the Alamo, you know, while it is important, some people argue maybe its importance has been exaggerated just because it's got a cool setting. It has very cool characters in it. Um, but it does serve as important for some reason. Again, motivation uh, to declare independence, motivation to, um, uh, as we'll see in the future, fighting the Mexican army, um, you know, giving Sam Houston a little extra time to find soldiers. But some people argue that even all those things together, maybe the Alamo isn't as important. And maybe it's sort of just a speed bump for Santa Ana's army. It sort of slows them down uh, for a little over a week uh, and, and allows Sam Houston to get his men together. I don't know if I would go as far to say it's a speed bump, but maybe we've exaggerated it's important a little bit just, just because it's such a cool setting. So while the Alamo's going on, Sam Houston, he's preparing to retreat from Gonzales. He sends word down here to uh, James Fannin, uh, who has, has these soldiers down here protecting Goliad. And he says to Fannin, hey, start retreating east. 
uh, the Alamo's fallen. Let's uh, let's gather our forces in the east. Let's defend things there. Well, Fannin, again, Sam Houston. A lot of people questioning his leadership. Who made you in charge? You know, and and uh, I think that you know I, I know what's better for the army than you do. Fannin's going to be sort of delaying things, and and he's going to wait until March nineteenth to pick up and leave. And though Sam Houston had been calling on him uh, for a while to to retreat and head east, sort of merge their armies in the east. Well, Fannin delays back and forth, going back and forth, saying I don't know about this. Well, unfortunately for Fannin. Uh, so Santa Ana is going to start heading in Houston's direction. Unfortunately for Fannin, this is where a different portion of Santa Ana's army had been coming along the coast. They're going to surround him on March 19th, six miles out of Goliad. Mexican cavalry will surround him. There's going to be a brief skirmish between uh, Fannin's forces. And I, uh, you see here Santa Ana sent a little bit of uh, men down here to reinforce the uh, Mexican soldiers coming this direction. They surround Fannin's forces. Uh, Fannin and his uh, 400 or so men uh, will get into a fight with this Mexican cavalry. And they will, after a brief skirmish, are going to be surrounded. Uh, Fannin will surrender Mexican forces, uh, hoping for mercy. But just like they did at the Alamo, um, the uh, Texas forces will um, uh, decide. I'm sorry, the Mexican forces will decide. We're not going to spare anybody. They're going to line up Fannin and his men, and uh, they will uh, shoot and kill them. A handful of the men, as they're being fired upon, uh, you know, as prisoners, handful are going to manage to escape, get into a nearby river, and then make their way uh, back uh, to Sam Houston and basically say, "Now Goliad uh, is fallen. Now Fannin has been surrounded." Uh, and his men killed and so now you have men who were died at, at the Alamo men who died here at Goliad that's kind of interesting this is a picture of Fannin uh, what he basically says is that uh, right before he shot is he says can his watch be given to his family and he asks uh, that he be shot in the chest like a soldier and they be given a Christian b burial well the firing squad the Mexican firing squad basically uh, shoots him in the face takes his watch and throws his body on a funeral pyre with the rest of the men killed at Goliad so by the end of March not only has you know 200 men or so died at the Alamo but now you've had uh, well over 300 men being executed at Goliad and you have Sam Houston fleeing east. Well, this is going to set off what some people call the runaway scrape. So San Antonio's fallen, Goliad's fallen, and Sam, Santa Ana's forces are going to be heading east. Sam Houston's going to be running back east himself. And Sam Houston's basically going to be saying to all these settlements along the way, pack up your stuff, get out of here, don't leave anything behind for the Mexican army. Again, his thought is, you get over here to the east, and what he's hoping is that uh, we're going to get reinforcements over here. He actually is thinking maybe my friend uh, Andrew Jackson here in the United States will view the Mexican army, think it's a threat. Maybe the American army will come over here and support us. But just know the Mexican army starts pushing in, and as they push in, uh, towards East Texas, all the settlements that have been built up over the past decade or so, a lot of them are going to be abandoned. Some even burned to the ground to prevent the uh, Mexican army from having anything when they arrive. And Mexican forces will start pushing east, and Sam Houston's going to be running for his life.